Did they give at a the council? You mean? No, here. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, plan commission meeting. It's Monday, March 9th, 2020. Panic. We do have a quorum. And the first thing on the agenda would be uh, consideration of the meeting minutes from February 10th. And I'd uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So I a motion by uh, Commissioner Seltzer. Is there a second? I'll second. By Alderperson Caravello. Any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Thank you. Item number three on our agenda is the council representative report. All the person Caravello. And the council report uh, at the February 11th council meeting, ordinance one of 2020 was approved. Uh, and at the February 25th council meeting, resolutions R33, R34, R35, 36, and 37 of 2020 were also all approved. Okay, thank you. Uh, commissioners, have any questions about what was approved at council? Hearing none, we'll go into our staff report. Uh, Director Shield. Containing your packet is just a quick summary of a few projects that have come through the Planning Commission in the last year or so. Um, there's really a, nothing of particular note. If you have any questions, I'd certainly try to answer them for you. Any questions about the staff report? Does the um, the one that we have in there for NAFO, does that, what happens with that? You got some note in there about... Still continue to work with bringing it into compliance. Yep. Okay. Have those... Uh, Heard rumor those buildings have gone up for sale they are we've been in contact with the realtor okay so uh, we don't know exactly where that stands but they are on the market all right got it okay any other questions regarding staff reports <coughs> hearing none item number five is a request by uh, Jeremiah Nelson for projecting signage approval at 135 West Main Street and who would like to begin this? I'll just give a quick overview. This particular item's in your packet for action because it's within our downtown overlay district. Um, the request is contained in your materials along with photographs of the site and the signage that's planned to um, fill in a location where a previous tenant had signage on this facility. So contained in the packet is kind of the checklist that we typically go through. Did anybody have any questions about the checklist or somebody prepared to make a motion? So I'm assuming the sign is within the metal arms there, is that right? Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So I, I would entertain a motion uh, for approval of the sign as requested. <coughs> I'll move to approve the recommendation. All right. Is there a second? Second. Uh, I didn't hear it. Second. Commissioner Robinson. Okay. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Item number six is a request by Zinc Power for approval of a conditional use permit at 2443 County Highway A for a heavy industrial use, an accessory structure up to 5,000 square feet in area, an increase to the maximum building height from 45 feet to 62 feet, and an increase to the maximum smokestack height above the roof from 10 to 15 feet. 
So there is a public hearing related to this item. Um, applicants are here if there's questions. This site, as you recall, was um, this lot was created as part of a CSM recently approved by both Planning <coughs> Commission and Council to create a parcel between Stoughton Trailers and the new public works facility along County A. Um, on your site, or on, it, on the screen actually shows just a general depiction of that. As the mayor enumerated, there's four different aspects of this conditional use request. One of them is related to, ironically, uh, allowing a heavy industrial use within a heavy industrial zoning district. So um, we'll talk about those type of nuances later. Um, the, other, the other three, one's related to a larger accessory structure. One is related to allowing a larger or a taller maximum building height. And the last one's to allow a slightly larger um, smokestack from uh, above the roof line as well. So with that, you're certainly welcome to open the public hearing. Sure. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions before we go into the public hearing? Okay, hearing none, we'll close our regular hearing and then we'll reopen for the public hearing. And I do have at least one person wishing to speak, and that would be uh, Emily Barr. You can come on up to the microphone. It looks like we have your address, so we're good there. And you might just want to adjust your microphone a little bit so we can hear you Yes, clearly. by the way, we back here can't hear you people at all. Oh. So if you have a volume control, at least for me, it would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I am here because I own a property across Highway A from this location. It would be to the north, to the upper part of that diagram. So clearly I have some questions and I think I have them all here. I only have questions. I have nothing to tell you. I have nothing to say. I just have questions. Is Zinc Power owned by some or all of the Stoughton Trailer ownership? Or is it totally freestanding separate entity? And just so you know, we'll write down the questions. Oh. Typically we don't engage in Q&A, oh, but all as right. we have our deliberation, we'll try to touch on them. Is deliberations um, It'll be after limited? the public hearing. No, is it, lim is it pri private only? What, what do you call that? Closed session? No, no but okay. it, it would be amongst the group here or the representatives from the organization. Got it, but we can hear it. <clears throat> yes. All right, all right, but that's what I meant by closed session. Sure. Where is the sanitary sewer for this building proposed to come from and go to? which direction and where. Clearly, I, not clearly, not clear to anybody but me, I have a sanitary sewer question in regard to this, whether it's going to go out onto Highway A, into a manhole and into a main that's there, or whether it will traverse across all of Stoughton Trailer's property to where they currently are on Academy Street. Where will the primary road access truck access be for whatever trucks are coming and going and how much truck traffic will there be? The current truck terminal, not where they manufacture the trailers, but the truck terminal part has very little traffic as opposed to when I first bought my property. There was kind of nothing and then it got to be really a lot and now it's kind of back down to very manageable. They mostly do repair work there from what I can tell. So the traffic coming in and out of either Highway A or wherever they're going to go would be a question that I would like to have asked. And you answered already what the current zoning is because I wondered why a conditional use for this current zoning. You're going to get to that. The smokestack, which Rodney just referred to as being larger, why is it so high and what is the <clears throat> effluvium that comes out of it that it needs to be that high? And what... What gaseous or not microbial, that's just what we hear on TV about the disease thing, but what gaseous stuff is going to be going on there? Paint fumes, stuff fumes, I don't understand what galvanizing or zinc coating or whatever it is is all about. So a little bit of an explanation as to what is going to go on there and why does this chimney need to be so high? I understand if it needs to be higher because the building is higher, but adding some more to an already very tall building to get another very tall chimney where the drop off to the land to the east to the right is pretty significant. I'd like an answer on that. 
are there any other questions you would like me to ask? I think I'm at the bottom of my list, but I would like to know my last one. What is the stuff that's going to come out of that smokestack? Will it smell? Will it be uh, negative to human beings or animals or plants in any way? You know, the typical kind of thing that people would worry about if you see a whole lot of stuff belching out of a smokestack. That's it. Okay. Do you have all of them? I'm available for questions. <laughs> I'm just going to sit down. All right. Thank you very much. And would anyone else like to speak at the public hearing regarding this matter? Um, hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and then we'll reopen for our regular business. <clears throat> so maybe we could do, is there an overview we want to go through of the plan or we do have representatives here that are welcome to come up and speak to it as well. Think if, they, if they have an opportunity to speak to those, that would yep. be helpful. Yep. Did you want to come up and speak, Joe? Oh. Come on up. Just maybe just introduce yourself and your address for the record. And yeah, you'll have to adjust that microphone probably all the way up. Okay. <laughs> My name is Joe Langemeyer, and I am uh, Vice President of Business Development for Zinc Power USA. Uh, our business address is uh, down in Weatherford, Texas, but I live in Omaha, Nebraska currently. And I work from home, which means I travel a lot. So drove in the rain all day to get here today for this meeting tonight. Um, I, I, I want to say that uh, we're here because one of your local employers, Stoughton Trailers, has an opportunity to gain uh, a very strong competitive advantage in their business and has great potential for growth if they can supply a cost competitive galvanized trailer to the market. So we are entertaining uh, partnering with them to give them cost-effective hot dip galvanizing, which is a zinc coating that we put on the steel. It is not paint. We use no solvents. There will be no VOCs or anything like that coming from uh, the building or the structure. And um, uh, we expect to be uh, very good neighbors to everyone in the community. Do you want me to address the questions? If you're willing or able to, that yeah. would be great. Let's start with the, the stuff that's going to be belching out of the stacks. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, there's three primary uh, chimneys. Number one, and probably the tallest, will be the furnace flue. Uh, we have to melt the zinc. Uh, we run our zinc bath at 840 degrees Fahrenheit. That requires a pretty substantial furnace um, to melt the zinc down and keep it molten 24-7. Uh, so we will be burning natural gas, which burns extremely cleanly. And so there, there will be no smoke or anything belching out of there, and there should not be any, any kind of toxic issues of any sort uh, coming from that. Secondly, this is one of the most state-of-the-art facilities in our industry worldwide. Uh, this is German engineering on this facility, and our process tanks, we have to clean the steel before we can dip it in the zinc and apply the zinc coating to it. And uh, so we have a number of vats that we dip the steel in to get it clean ahead of time. All of the air and all of the fumes, if you will, um, and steam, because we do heat these tanks so that they react properly, uh, is captured and put through a wet scrubber. So one of the stacks is for a wet scrubber that cleans the air coming off of our process tanks. And uh, we expect to be putting just, just clear, clean air out of the building. So. Uh, and the last one is for our, um, yeah, our dust collector. Our dust collector. Oh. Uh, when we dip steel that has a zinc ammonium chloride um, uh, flux on the surface into the hot zinc, sometimes we do get a little bit of zinc oxide that comes off of the zinc bath in the form of kind of a white smoke looking uh, uh, emission. We capture that in a bag house and put it through bag filters, and then clean air is emitted out of that stack uh, into the environment. So uh, basically, these are the cleanest galvanizing plants uh, in the world. And because we use no solvents, there are no volatile organic com compounds coming out of our facility. Um, there are no sulfates coming out of the facility, uh, and there are no hazardous air pollutants uh, coming out of the facility. So it's, it's a very clean process. Um, Oh, why does the stack have to be so high? I think that's physics, isn't it? 
we basically just have to have that stack up above the roof so we get the airflow. So like a flue on a chimney in your house, we've got to have the air moving out of that stack. So the height is of the stack is dictated by the height of the building. And we will not make them any higher than we have to to get the airflow. Uh, traffic and turning radius, I believe we submitted to the uh, Planning Commission that we would be expecting around 30 trucks a day uh, at the high side coming in and out of this facility. Uh, initially, we will be galvanizing for Stoughton trailers and for other customers uh, within, say, 150 mile radius of Stoughton. And so we will have their trucks and trailers coming in and out of that facility. Over time, we will be, as they grow, uh, we expect the Stoughton trailers will be capturing about 100% of our capacity. And so the, the traffic at that point will convert over to them shipping galvanized parts to their other facilities around uh, to be assembled. And so that traffic pattern uh, should not get much heavier than that over time, I don't anticipate, from our use. Did I answer all your questions, ma'am, or, or is there anything else? Oh. The sanitary sewer goal, where is the road access? Okay, the, the sanitary sewer, first of all, the only sanitary sewer requirements we have for this facility will be for sinks and toilets uh, for human. There are no drains in this facility and none of our process, nothing goes to sanitary sewer. Uh, as part of our development program, we will have to put a water management plan together wastewater for rain runoff going, going into the uh, storm sewers. And we will have, in compliance with regulations, we will have a wastewater management plan uh, that meets all local, county, and state codes to make sure that we manage any runoff coming from that facility. So. They go all the way down to Stoughton factory privately across Stoughton's land. Where are you going to go? Not you, your building. We haven't gotten that far yet. We're going to take it wherever we're told to take it. I think. Well, so what we'll do is we'll sit down with Stoughton Utilities and we'll <coughs> figure out what you know makes the most sense as far as how to run that. And I'm sure there'll be some factors like costs and those types of things that will be taken into consideration, but we haven't really had those discussions yet. I will tell you, we plan to employ about 60 people when we're up and running, so we'll have that much volume to deal with, mm -hmm. and we're, we're willing to do what we need to do to make sure that we don't impact negatively any of the infrastructure. Um, and the road access. We'll be coming in off of that north road, and uh, we will design that intersection uh, to comply with the amount of traffic that we're expecting. Right, do any of the commissioners have any questions? Uh, all the person Schumacher. Plenty. Okay. I'm Make certain. sure they can hear you out there. I'm certain that if uh, if you've got a, you're working in a state of the art facility, I'm assuming that you're going by a non cyanide preparation of your steel versus. Thank you. N no cyanide involved at all. Thank you. <laughs> um, you're a wet scrubber. Um, what kind of contaminants does that produce, and what will happen with those contaminants? if it does produce contaminants, scrubbing the air with a wet scrubber? It doesn't really produce much. The water that comes off of that, which captures, <clears throat> will be put back into our process because it'll, it'll take our... It was, so basically we have steam coming off of the tanks, we'll capture, we'll let the particulates collect in water, we'll take that, put it back in the tanks, and then emit air. So... And did you have more questions? Yep, still more. Um, you said in, in your zinc process, when you, you're melting your zinc, you've got, you're using zinc ammonia chloride, is that correct? Zinc ammonium chloride ammonium is chloride. the chemistry of our flux sure, that sure. we put on. Yes. So if, as you get that into, into the heated condition, obviously it's going to deposit the zinc onto the steel as you want it to. 
then what becomes of the ammonium chloride? Does that volatilize off of the steel then, or? Sorry, yeah. I'm a chemist. That's so. all right. Um, then I'll be very cautious how I answer your question, <laughs> <laughs> because I am not a chemist, all right? Uh, basically, the flux enables the zinc to react. It's a chemical reaction between the zinc, molten zinc and the steel, and the flux the fluxing process does two things. Number one, it's, it's slightly acidic, so it cl finishes pickling the steel mm -hmm. and keeping it clean because non-clean steel will not galvanize. Right. And then it, it puts the zinc ammonium chloride on the surface to protect it from flash rusting. As we immerse that into the 840 degree zinc bath, uh, the part of that is consumed, part of it turns into zinc oxide, and that is what we capture in our bag, uh, bag house. Okay. And the zinc bath will be completely enclosed, so we capture all the air coming off the zinc bath. Okay, so that will be that will be the one place where I think because the the rest of the rest of the chemical equation that's in there does leave you with uh, with free ammonia that would be coming out of there. So whether there are mechanisms that are able to capture that ammonia that's coming off free. That is a question I've never had. All right. The ammonia issue, I, it's not, honestly, I've, I've never had to deal with the ammonia question. I don't know. All right. We'll get an answer. Okay. Um, and you said none of your liquid from your process goes into, into sanitary sewer, but you will have a wastewater plant on site for management of that. Right. Um, what? in your wastewater plant is monitored and how is that monitored? Is that a conductivity monitor? Let's, let's back up a sec. We will not have a waste water managed. We'll, we'll have a, 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 am I using the wrong storm water? You just misspoke earlier. You said wastewater, but he went rain, meant rainwater. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Storm okay. Water. Storm water. That's storm what I'm Storm water. Storm okay. No, we okay. don't have waste. We, um, yeah, so we, no, we do not, we're not going to be treating any water or anything. All right, how is, how is that monitored as, because I'm sure you're not just going to discharge this off into wherever, but... Our process has no discharge. None. Of water. Right, no. How do you handle your solids? Uh, those will be, uh, we, we clean the, the bottoms of the tanks out periodically, depending on the volume of steel going through, and those are handled through a waste management company. Okay, so they, they ship that stuff off-site then? I'm assuming collected and off-site, and then, but then, still, your any of your water processing is that monitored for any sort of free zinc or. The we will comply with our rainwater runoff for any kind of zinc, and do testing on that. Yes, but most of our, well, we'll we'll incorporate that into our water management system. Okay. After. All right. Now I'm assuming that you're going to build this according to whatever whatever county and state. Absolutely. statutes are requiring that Absolutely. sort of thing but I'm always extra cautious especially with with free zinc that gets into into any of you know we're very plentiful in water around this area so if that leaks into that area or into our water system I mean that has devastating effects understand and that's not unusual to be cautious that is yep all right I think that's that's all, all right. I've got. If you so. think any more, let me know. I'm sure I've got plenty more. So. <laughs> all right. Anybody else have any questions or comments or thoughts? Commissioner Barman. <clears throat> Just a couple of questions with respect to the height. Yes. Um, which I'm not having, you know, significant issues with. But um, how does the height of your building compare to the adjacent buildings that are, for example, shown in our our plan view here? How much taller is your building versus the... the uh, I am not sure how tall their building is. Um, originally, my understanding of the zoning requirement of the 45 feet was from street level, mm -hmm. and we're only going to be about seven feet above that 45 because we're dropping because it down drop 10 to 12 feet, feet yeah. to be on grade with uh, plant number five, Stoughton's mm -hmm. building. And so, but we, we will be about 62 feet tall on the on the north side of the building where the uh, the zinc bath is. Okay. And again, that's to give us crane height clearance so that we can dip their long parts. Right, right. But uh, relative, it's going to be taller. I don't I don't know how tall their building is. Okay. Um, because of the drop in grade, 
mm -hmm. I kind of figured it wasn't going to be that high compared to the street level, which right, you right. confirmed for me. And I just was kind of curious how, how it relates to one of the things when we were evaluating height, what would have been helpful in the submittals would have been some sort of elevation view showing that the comparative height, which we don't have. So I'm just trying to kind of gauge it. In my yeah, head. all we have is relative to the street, I think, yeah. on that drawing. Okay, but you're about seven foot above 45, so about 52 foot from the street grade, rather than 62 foot from right. the street grade, right? Yeah, it's ten to. Ten. We're not done with that piece of it. We haven't spent the money on that engineering, but we're going to be dropping 10 to 12 feet yeah. from street level down. Okay. Great. Thank you. Did you come up with one? I did. I knew would you it, would. <laughs> would it be possible that I could talk with some of your, your chemical engineers, some of your process engineers about through the whole process? Certainly. Certainly. I'd appreciate that if I could have some contacts for that. Okay. In, uh, any other questions from the commissioners or there anything you, you want to add? The site plan is not before you tonight. That will be coming back at a subsequent meeting. So we're, what we're looking for tonight, I think there's a res resolution in the packet. Um, we're just looking for a recommendation on the, um, the conditional use permit. And then from here it would go to council. Is that the process? That's correct. And then, as Rodney mentioned, then the site plan would come back for further, would review the site plan as well. And the site plan, does that come through here and the council as well, or yeah. just here? Just here. Just here. So perhaps some of the other questions you may have, um, we can have answered at that um, upcoming meeting. So. I, I, if I might, just one comment sure. re relative to your question about the ammonia. The, uh, all of the, whatever, fumes or whatever come off of the flex tank itself are captured in the wet scrubber. And then everything coming off the zinc bath will go through the bag house. So, but I, what I don't know is how effective that'll be on uh, ammonia gas. I wouldn't expect it would uh, stop that, but uh, it can in some cases. I mean, I guess it would depend upon what your what your temperature difference is, or, or ultimately what temperature your water scrubber is running, and what pH your the water is that you're using. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, um, we're looking for a recommendation. Uh, to send the city council on the conditional use permit portion. I will vote to approve. There's a motion by Caravello. Is there a second? I'll stand for it. Second by Robinson. <clears throat> and one last time for questions or comments. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed, that carries. So this will be at the council meeting on two weeks from tomorrow. Two weeks from tomorrow in this room at seven o'clock. That's an invitation. I'll be here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'd like to see you again. Yeah, enjoy the weather while you're here. It's it's almost spring. <laughs> All right. Next item, uh, number seven, is a request by Quick Trip for approval of a conditional use permit for an in-vehicle sales and service use, including outdoor display incidental to an indoor sales use at 1700 <coughs> East Main Street. And this one we have a notice for a public hearing and we do kind of have a plan here. Uh, Rodney will walk us through this and then we'll, we'll go through the public hearing process. So the applicant Quick Trip applied for a conditional use permit for the indoor commercial sales for this site. They're still working through a number of site plan issues and they requested that they delay action on, on the request. Um, it is noticed as a public hearing, so there's certainly an opportunity to take public testimony. The intention would be to still adjourn the public hearing so that it could be re-continued at the next uh, plan commission meeting where we anticipate Quick Trip will come back with um, more, more answers and or um, seeking final action on that, that request. Too. Okay. Are there any questions before we go into the public hearing from commissioners? Hearing none, we'll close our regular meeting.
and then we'll reopen for the public hearing. And we have a letter that's at our, our table here that you can consider as part of the public hearing. I won't go through and read it since it's right in front of you. Uh, we do have at least one person that would, I believe, like to speak and perhaps another one that may as well. Um, the first one I have signed up would be Scott Quam. And we have your address, so if you want to just adjust the microphone there and, okay. and let us know what's on your mind. Welcome. Um, hi, yeah, Scott Quam, my wife and I, Stacy, live across the street on 300 Stone Ears Trail. Um, we bought the property from Matson Realty in uh, 1996. And we're totally aware that that's commercial property over there and it was going to be sold as commercial. And we're okay with it. And um, we're also not anti quick trip at all. So just so everybody knows. And I really didn't know that this was just a question only um, time thing here tonight. But my question is um, when is there going to be a time that we're going to be able to debate um, some of the traffic issues and some of the other things that are happening here? So um, the intention, just so you know, is, is we'll have the public hearing tonight and then we're going to adjourn it, which means we can pick it up at the next meeting when they're ready to present that right. plan. And right now that plan's not really ready for right. presentation. So that material will be posted as soon as we get it on our website and it'll be included in the packet as well. So if you want to come to the next when that I don't know if it'll be at next month's meeting, that's my assumption. But at a future meeting, when that's on there, you'll be welcome to come back and speak again if you wish. Okay, okay, and that's why I signed up, so Perfect. thank you. And then I know uh, Tom Matson signed up. I didn't know if you wanted to speak or if you're here to answer questions. Okay, okay. Uh, sure, if you want to come up, just uh, if you could just introduce yourself and give us your address so we can put it into the record, and then uh, we'd be more than happy to hear from you. Sure. Hi, I'm Maggie Gasner, and I'm the owner of Weeble World, which is right next door at 1815 Cedar Brook Lane. Um, I, I came more just for informational purposes, looking at the site plan that they have here. My main concerns are the traffic flow. Um, and what we have been using and what we've used in the past is our access on Cedar Brook and also the shared easement that Fastenal and Karate and the salon and the daycare use. So if that's no longer going to be available, um, my concern is where the traffic flow for quick trips going to be. They have gas pumps on one lot, and then I'm assuming pedestrians will be walking across to the store to pay for their fuel or what have you. So I would be concerned about pedestrians walking across the easement, um, if that easement will be closed off. At, at kind of the, the section in the middle um, between the four plots of land, um, I guess I just have a whole bunch of questions, but will we will we also be receiving another notice um, at when they're going to be having another meeting? Right now, it's planned to be next month. Okay. Unless we hear otherwise, it's planned to be reopened at the next meeting. Okay. And so, do you know if these issues with the traffic flow will be addressed at that at that time? Um, they're presenting their materials. We've got the draft materials that are in the packet visible for you guys to look at as well, but we have not got a complete package. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Hello. My name is Seth Degnan, and uh, I'm the owner, co-owner of Kix Unlimited, along with uh, Matt Griffey here as well. Uh, Kix Unlimited it is at 1740 East Main Street in the same building as Fastenal. Uh, very similar uh, questions and concerns as Maggie has currently to get to uh, to get to the fast and all building I'll call it for the sake of reference uh, people enter on the west side from County N right between the gas pumps where the gas pumps are and the building uh, there is a, a roadway that comes through there and then people turn down in uh, and so the main concern is what what gives access to the Fastenal building in that lot specifically once this project is done. Uh, our people are going to be expected to pull in through uh, the north side on Cedar Brook and drive down there, or will they be cutting through um, 
whether that's the intended purposes, I can foresee people still cutting through between the gas pumps and the station to get back to our building. Uh, or alternatively, they'll be going to uh, they'll be going back to Cedar Brook Lane and then cutting through uh, Weevil World's parking lot. I don't know if I is that your you own the parking lot that land right there. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Whether that I didn't wasn't aware if that was an easement or you know where uh, a, a, a public easement where uh, there's access to our area. So that is the main thing is is how how is the access going to be and the traffic that comes through to uh, to Fastenal to Kicks Unlimited the the salon and the other daycare at the end of that same building. Um, those are all going to be concerns. And then especially during construction, uh, what will be set up for people to have. Um, Convenient access to our to our businesses during that time. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Director Shields just going to walk us through a little bit about what our jurisdiction is as it relates to this site. Just uh, real quickly, the parcel that's in question here for Quick Trip um, that they're citing, um, there is no direct access to <coughs> Highway 51. It's access restricted. Fast and all building has the same uh, limitation. Um, the only access point that they have along um, County N is the current point where it has access right now. So there's further restrictions on other, there, there is no other access points on the County Highway N. So for however the site develops, um, it certainly has that location and access potentially to Cedar Brook Lane. Um, the easement questions and access to the other buildings certainly are questions that are, are trying to be worked through. Um, but that's the, that's the jurisdictional issue. County Highway, Dane County has jurisdiction over the improvements that may or may not be necessary on County Highway N for that access point. Obviously the access point's there now, but if there's further requirements for construction of anything in the right-of-way, Dane County would have jurisdiction over that. Any questions from the commissioners? Otherwise, um, what we're looking to do is is have a motion to adjourn from the public hearing, and that allows us to pick it up where we left off at the next meeting. Oh, sorry, somebody else? My name is Jerry Judd. I own the building that is rented to Fastenal and the karate thing. My main thing is to keep things so it's convenient and accessible for my tenants to get on that easement. So at this point, I haven't decided and don't know yet whether I'm, what's going to happen with that easement. Right now, it belongs to me and was given for the past no building, right? So I guess I can't give you an answer right now. Um, so you're in conversations with Quick Trip, then I would imagine. I don't know if Quick Trips has ever talked to me. Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, I think, is the owner of that piece. I think he's talked to me on it. And I don't think Quick Trip is, that I can recall, has ever called me on it. Sure. So uh, it is main concern of mine at easement so as far as what i can do or will do i do not know at this point okay so. all right well we'll try to get you the information as we receive it um okay. right now you have everything that we do okay so this will be another meeting about a month from now yep yes okay okay thank you thank you anybody else would like to speak Okay, um, back to the commissioners. Do you have any questions or comments or anything at this point? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn the public hearing, and then we'll reconvene that at the next meeting. I'll make that motion. A motion by Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Second you got by. Three of them. You got three of them. Take huh? your pick. I said you got three of them. All Take right, your pick. We'll go with, uh, with Seltzer then. And then... Uh, any uh, comments or questions on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
none opposed. So that will be on the next meeting's agenda. And I think that's all we have on that item for this evening. Um, now we get to the fun stuff. Uh, item number eight is to discuss potential zoning ordinance amendments. And as you can see that um, City Attorney uh, Dragney is here tonight to, to hopefully shed some insight on uh, what the issues are on some of our uh, zoning ordinances and what we might want to consider doing going forward. All right. Hello, everyone. It's been a little while, but good to see you all again. Uh, you're um, welcome to stay, but I don't blame you if you leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going to be the best part of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when the attorney speaks, they all leave. Everybody's ready to go. Man, all right. What is the date of your April meeting? Uh, we'll get it for you. <clears throat> it's April. April 13th. April 13th. It'll Next be right one. here. Okay, you. you bet. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, you, as you can see from the title, uh, I'm here to talk tonight about changes in the law relating to conditional use uh, permits and proceedings relating to conditional use permits. Um, let's start with just some background and some context. Um, historically, uh, conditional use permits have been viewed by the courts and used as municipalities as um, kind of a flexible zoning tool uh, that gives a group such as yourselves the opportunity to evaluate proposed conditional uses on a case-by-case -case basis and make determinations about whether they are appropriate or not at a given location and to attach conditions potentially to those uses. Um, a couple years ago, we had a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision um, it's the All Energy case, All Energy v. Trempolo County. Um, in, in this particular case, Trempolo County, we were talking about land that was zoned ag, and there was a proposal to engage in uh, frac sand mining on this land. The frac sand mining was, in fact, allowable as a conditional use under the applicable um, zoning code. Um, and the majority decision in that Wisconsin Supreme Court case, well, so the, the, the county land use committee that kind of is the equivalent of what the plan commission is here, um, rejected the application for conditional use approval, turned it down. That was appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. The majority decision sustained that denial, um, and uh, but there was a dissent, a dissenting opinion that became uh, very significant and became, I think, the basis for legislation that was then adopted by the legislature, 2017 Wisconsin Act 67. Um, so before Act 67, municipalities were viewed as having fairly wide discretion uh, when evaluating a conditional use app application. Uh, the dissenting in opinion in the All Energy case had a very different view of how conditional use permits should be evaluated um, and essentially took the position that a conditional use should be treated more like a permitted use so long as the applicant could meet the standards in the ordinance. Um, here's a quote from the case. A conditional use is not a loose end. It is a determination that the identified use is compatible with the zoning district and is subject only to appropriate conditions to control for the potentially hazardous aspects of the specific proposal under consideration. Um, the dissenting opinion in that case evaluated the limited circumstances for denying a CUP. Here's another interesting quote. It says, this places substantial limitations on the reasons a municipality can give for denying a conditional use permit because the types of uses identified as conditional uses are sanctioned and either desirable or necessary to the community, an application for such a use may not be denied because the owner proposes to engage in that type of use. Such objections are in order when the municipality adopts or amends its zoning ordinance and considers which conditional uses, if any, to include of each of its zoning districts. So backing up a little bit, just talking about in this case, so in the all-energy case, the zoning code said 
frac sand mining is allowable in that district as a conditional use. Much of the testimony that was presented at the public hearing amounted to objections from neighbors complaining about frac sand mining. And Justice Kelly's point was, wait a minute, the ordinance says frac sand mining is allowable in this district. You can't turn it down just because it's frac sand mining. There has to be a, some other kind of standard that is used then to judge whether to allow it or not. I mean, his point was the community already made a policy decision that it's okay in this district. And so you can't turn it down just because it is what it is, a frac sand mine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, okay. So how about the desirable or necessary to the community definition? Part that, of well, he, he was saying that the community had already made a policy decision, decision by saying that it's allowable in that district, that in fact it is allowable, that it is sanctioned, that it is desirable, that there's a need for it. He said, when you put in your code and you said, you can do that in this district as a conditional use, you made the policy decision that it is all of those things. It's, it's allowable. It's not permitted as a matter of right, but it is allowable. And what really bothered him was, he said, look, <clears throat> we can't then have you the communities making first the policy decision that this is allowable, but then having on individual cases communities saying, no, because it is what it is, you know, on the, without something more. And we'll get into what does that something more look like in terms of what kinds of standards would be appropriate to consider. Um, this dissenting opinion took a, a, re a restrictive view of authority to create subjective and ambiguous ordinance standards that an applicant must satisfy to get a conditional use permit. So the couple quotes, the whole point of requiring a set of knowable standards is to limit the basis on which the county may deny a permit. And he said, our job is to determine whether, whether the committee properly measured All Energy's specific proposal against knowable and certain standards, and then determined whether the imposition of appropriate conditions would allow implementation of the proposal while simultaneously protecting the public's legitimate interest. And we're going to talk more about this concept of standards, what kind of standards are um, appropriate now under the law in, a, in the context of a conditional use process. The All Energy Dissent argued that once a government establishes a conditional use, in a zoning district, it determines that the use is consistent for that area. The question then is, becomes what standards and conditions the municipality can impose to protect against negative externalities. And that, so that was a dissenting opinion in that case. He didn't win that case as the dissent, but then the legislature followed up with this legislation. <clears throat> so the statute now says, um, Well, I want to back up. I don't know. Do we have a definition of? First, I want to start with how the statute defines a conditional use. Um, the, the, the statute, de and I don't know that I have a slide on this, but the statute defines a conditional use as not only what we are used to thinking about as conditional use, where in your zoning code you have a list of permitted uses and a list of conditional uses. You had a couple tonight. Um, but it, it includes. Uh, in the language of the statute, not only that kind of conditional use, but any case where special zoning permission is, is required under the zoning code. It does not include a variance. So a variance decision is not a conditional use permit decision. It does not include a, a rezoning decision. So the policy decision whether to change the zoning of property from, say, residential to commercial, it's not that. but. It is any time where someone is wanting to do something under the code that the code says, you know, you can do this, but you need some kind of special approval. So in addition to the site, to the conditional use permits that we are used to seeing here, um, we are thinking in, at, in, in my firm that probably a site plan approval, special zoning permission. Uh, we also have a number of things in our zoning code in Stoughton, and you're not unique, where Special approval is required to do all kinds of things. For example, in our, we spend a lot of time talking about our downtown design overlay zoning district and 
the different kinds of approvals that you might need in that district to do things, depending on what kind of project, same kind of thing. I'm thinking that all of those kinds of procedures that we have built into our zoning code now may well be subject to this new statutory framework uh, that we're going to be talking about tonight. So here's some, some interesting things from the statute. One, uh, one section of the statute says, if an applicant for a conditional use permit meets or agrees to meet all of the requirements and conditions specified in the city ordinance or those imposed by the city zoning board, the city shall grant the conditional use permit. Pretty strong language. And this appears to follow the all energy dissent. The statute says that requirements and conditions must be reasonable and to the extent practicable, measurable. And I'll take a minute to talk about, when we talk about requirements and conditions, I really break these down into two different buckets. The first bucket is, what kind of standards do we have in our zoning code that you're required to apply when you're making a decision? So I think those requirements or standards need to be reasonable and to the extent practicable and measurable. And then the other kind of thing we could be dealing with would be a condition that, say, is attached to an approval. So for example, uh, we're approving your application subject to a condition that you, you do X or you do Y. That condition also would need to be reasonable, and in my mind, it would have to be rooted in the, in the standards. You know, this is a condition that we have to attach so that you will meet a standard in our ordinance, not just something that we made up on the spot without being tied to the ordinance. Um, and this suggests that standards based on general public health and welfare considerations could be subject to potential challenge. Um, so there, there's, there's kind of an impl implication in the language of the statute that standards that are quite common in ordinances today <coughs> that relate to general public health and safety are potentially not reasonable. Um, I'll, I'll read a couple of standards in your, in, 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 first I'll go back to the all energy decision. In that case, there was a standard that, that was relied on that basically said something like, uh, you know, the application can't be approved if it will be detrimental to the public health, safety, and general welfare. That was the standard in the ordinance. And in that case, the majority decision said that's fine. The dissenting opinion said, that's not an acceptable standard because that allows you to simply remake the basic question whether this is an appropriate use in that district. He's saying that decision's already been made. We got to get beyond that. Um, here's a couple standards in our ordinance. Under this chapter, a proposed conditional use shall be denied unless the applicant can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the city that the proposed conditional use will not create undesirable impacts on nearby properties, the environment, nor the community as a whole. I'm not so sure about that standard anymore. Um, here's one that is definitely a concern. This one says, is the proposed conditional use, and then it says in parentheses, the use in general, independent of its location, in harmony with the purposes, goals, objectives, policies and standards of the City of Stoughton Comprehensive Plan, this chapter, and any other plan, program, or ordinance adopted or under consideration pursuant to official notice by the city. And that's odd because that's just asking the question, so here you've got a use that's already listed as an allowable conditional use in a zoning district, and this standard asks whether that use, regardless of its location, is in harmony with the purposes and goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan. To me, that seems like an inappropriate standard. So moving on. Uh, and again, the language says standards must be reasonable and to the extent practicable measurable. So the legislature did leave some window for potentially standards that are that are not strictly objective measurable standards, but we're not sure yet 
how big a window that is, and the courts haven't yet given us guidance on that. When was this law put in place? This is 2017. It was during that session. Three years later, we still don't know. Court, uh, there's some there's litigation making its way, I think, through the pipeline, but we don't have any reported cases yet that are giving us clarity on this. So, so the courts are slower than government. That's what you're trying. To well, say. and you know, I mean, you all know that in most cases, when you deal with conditional use permits, there really isn't an issue. They, most decisions don't lead to litigation. So you need cases where, for one reason or another, there's a denial that then leads to litigation or an, or an approval, but more likely in a denial. Yes? Bill? So this, this act, I thought this sounded familiar, and I went back to look at my notes. And I thought, oh, shades of the May 14th, 2018 Planning Commission meeting, which was, I think, my first Planning Commission meeting, when the conditional use permit for the apartments on Hole Avenue were first brought forward. And we had a room full of people that lived out in, uh, Nordic, Ridge. In, in Nordic Ridge that were kind of acting like this, you know, this was completely out of the blue. And, and a lot of the, those folks were making arguments about the increased traffic volume on Hole Avenue and how are all those new residents of those apartment buildings going to get in and out of that area and the um, stress on Hole Avenue and Main Street or Highway 51. And where it seemed like, and I don't know if you were here or if we had a stand-in attorney from your office, but was here to basically explain to us what Act 60, this new Act 67 thing is. And... Did you hear that night? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> One of my colleagues was here doing that. Some, somebody was here, and I was like, oh. And that was in a real live hearing on an actual permit application. Yeah, except the folks that were here to observe that meeting were unaware that what was going to be explained to us after they offered their comments was actually going to pertain to uh, what they were here to talk about uh, or to express their feelings about. So I think just to sort of for you guys, I think that was a, um, it became like aware that, oh, the tables are sort of flipped if the community previously could have said, well, we think there's going to be an increased traffic volume that's going to be a potential safety situation where it seems like in the past the developer whoever was proposing to do that would have had to say well we've we've done a study and it's not going to be a problem so where you know a frac sand mine in in the olden days pre-2017 days it might have said the community could have said you guys have to prove to us how this is going to be safe or a benefit to our community or desirable. And now after Act 67, the community would have to go and like those neighbors would have had to say, would have had to band together and get a study, a traffic study done or something that would have argued to the developer why it is that. Well, we're getting into that next, Phil. Okay. You're, well, then I'll show We're just up. getting into that. No. <laughs> That's a good example, though. Yeah, so then we're getting into a discussion of what kind of evidence um, both the applicant would need to present to support their application or what kind of evidence would need to be available to support a denial. Let, we're going to get into that now. Um, so now um, the, the, the old standard was substantial evidence, um, and the new standard is also substantial evidence. Substantial evidence meaning evidence that a reasonable person could rely on. But there are a couple new things under the statute. Um, whoops, that's the wrong way. One, the statute now specifically says and expressly limits the use of personal preferences or speculation in reaching a decision. So the statute says substantial evidence means facts and information other than merely personal preferences or speculation directly pertaining to the requirements and conditions an applicant must meet to obtain a conditional use permit and that reasonable persons would accept in support of a conclusion. So now if uh, a resident comes in and, and says, 
you know, I think this is going to reduce my property value. I think this is going to increase traffic. I think this is going to be a problem. That's probably not substantial evidence. There would be need to be something more demonstrating that they're not simply expressing an opinion, but there's a, re a legitimate basis to support what they're saying, either through a study or depends on what the issue is, of course. But there's going to have to be more than just someone saying, I think this is going to decrease the value of my property, or I think this is a bad idea. That's not good enough. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're going to get into this, but I'll, I'll mention this now. I mean, one of the things that, that you may already be gathering is when you all are making a decision on something like this, you're actually acting in what's called a quasi-judicial capacity. So you're not just making a policy decision where you can make a judgment about what you think the right answer should be based on a whole broad range of you know, policy considerations, but now you are applying facts to law and making decision as if you were acting in a judicial capacity, and that's really what this is. Uh, oh, yeah, so just the fact that you've got a room full of people who are opposed to, to something is not going to be a basis for denial, even though it's certainly going to make policymakers feel uncomfortable <laughs> in some cases. Um, so th that's not to say that all public hearing testimony is irrelevant, but testimony that's simply classified as personal preference or opinion or is unrelated to ordinance standards, that's irrelevant. Substantial evidence is now required to be shown at three critical, critical stages. First, the burden of proof is on the applicant in the first instance to demonstrate that the criteria and the ordinance are met, and they need to do that by substantial evidence, evidence that's not just opinion testimony from them. Um, and, and the truth is that applicants, sophisticated applicants, you know, they generally are prepared for that. They, they have an opportunity to submit materials in support of their applications that show we've considered, you know, the standards in your ordinance. Of course, our standards are a little questionable because well, they're public health, safety, and general welfare to some extent, but they, they're at least in a position to do that. So they have the initial burden to do that. <laughs> The decision to approve or deny a permit must be supported by substantial evidence. And so you could say to an applicant, you haven't shown us that your proposal meets our standard. We don't need to hear from the neighbors or anyone else unless, you know, if you haven't shown us that you meet the standard, at least made a prima facie case, we can say no. And then any terms or conditions that you choose to attach to an approval must relate to the purpose of the ordinance and, and, and the standards in the ordinance and be based on substantial evidence. And this is uh, somewhat new. Um, the law didn't previously impose a specific requirement. Um, yeah, any condition that you impose, you have to be able to show this, this is furthering or needed to make sure that this meets our, our standards. So what are the implications? Applicants need to demonstrate that they're going to meet our standards. We as a municipality are going to have to make determinations based on substantial evidence and our standards and not merely local opinion. We have uh, more limited discretion in denying a conditional use permit. Conditions might, can still be useful tools, but conditions have to be based on evidence and, and related to our standards. Uh, Act 67 creates an explicit appeal process for the denial of a CUP, but not for the imposition of a condition, which is somewhat interesting. Under the statute, if a city denies a CUP, the person may appeal to the circuit court. And there is no reference to appealing a condition, although I think that someone could. Implications for using CUPs in zoning. So this is what I think a lot of communities are now 
grappling with is what should we do with our ordinance and how should we, re how should we adapt to this in changing environment? Um, one, I think we should be thinking about reducing our reliance on special zoning permissions or conditional use permits in our zoning code. Because it was a flexible zoning tool that was sanctioned by and large for decades, I think um, communities uh, came to use this kind of device in a, in a fairly broad variety of ways in zoning codes as an alternative to maybe uh, uh, other approaches that might require more, more difficult work on the front end. So, for example, um, um, being more liberal with allowing conditional uses in various zoning districts with this kind of broad public health, safety, and welfare standard rather than having more judicious in how we're uh, spreading those uses throughout the zoning code and having more objective standards. So I think one obvious step would be to go through our list of conditional uses and reduce those to the extent we can't. Um, and instead, to the extent we see uses that we know give rise to specific types of issues, like traffic, for example, build objective traffic-related standards into our ordinance. Um, we also have already, I'm sure we have lighting standards, we have noise standards. We can deal with a lot of the things in, that tend to be issues in these cases that people are concerned about through alternative standards. So, you know, make it a permitted use in the appropriate district with appropriate objective standards. Or the alternative, another option is to, um, if there are certain uses that you know you, you may need to create some room for, um, but you don't want to make it a permitted use and you're concerned about the conditional use process, we could consider creating some special zoning districts where someone would need to get a rezone to that district to, to allow for a particular kind of use. So then you have the discretion that goes with the rezoning decision to make that call. And we, I guess as you review your zoning code, you might identify certain uses where you would say, that's one where we should have a special zoning district where we, we would be having to rezone the property before that one would be allowed. Um, so reduce reliance on CUPs, develop reasonable standards. I talked about that. Those are, those are the, the main kind of tools I think are available to adapt to this new world. Um, and that's it. We haven't actually started doing any of that yet. We wanted to have this discussion tonight, and, and then I guess you all and the council and city staff will have to decide how do you want to move forward with this. We, we have prepared, and in your packet, I think we had a table, this table, just to give you some examples of conditional uses. Um, it, as you'll note on this table, heavy industrial near the bottom, that's one I highlighted earlier this evening, heavy industrial in the heavy industrial district is a conditional use. And maybe that's an academic one where that becomes a permitted use in the heavy industrial district. Um, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but that's, that one certainly rises to, uh, to my opinion, as to being uh, one that we might really seriously consider for permitted in the district. You can see the other examples here as well. Upper story dwelling units, for example, in neighborhood office, planned office, neighborhood business, or planned business are conditional. Um, yet primary uses in the district allow for residential upper apartments and or main floor on the rear. So there's a number of number of uses and we can go through all of these in more detail. Um, I don't know what additional conditions we could place on some of these uses as part of a um, conditional use process if it remained to evaluate whether those would be appropriate. Um, much like uh, City Attorney Dragney mentioned, maybe we have some where we actually 
um, remove it as a permitted and or conditional use in a particular district but create it as a permitted um, permitted in a different district that would have to be rezoned so there might be an opportunity if we have one that um, what you didn't elaborate on is when you do a rezoning there are circumstances where you can actually place conditions on a rezoning um, unlike the conditional use process but you still would have to use some some basis for those conditions that would be placed on those rezonings. Um, Michael prepared um, additional observations, for example, like in group developments, potentially for, for, for consideration, um, other changes that might be appropriate, not necessarily specific to conditional uses, but where there's multiple areas trying to impose additional conditions without standards, if you will, um, that might be appropriate for reconsideration. Um, Michael, did you want to elaborate on your observations related to these group developments or other? Yeah, ones? sure. Yeah, I think uh, just the group development in general, just a lot of the requirements don't really make a lot of sense. So either we have to um, put in some objective requirements or just eliminate the group development altogether. Um, Michael, a group development right now is treated as a conditional use, is that right? Correct. You yep. need a conditional use approval to do a group development. Correct. Yep. And that also includes, so if you have like a strip mall, each with four tenants in it, that's a group development, right? Multiple buildings on Multiple the same buildings, lot. Multiple buildings, yep, yep. Okay. yep. Right. Yeah, it's... I really struggle with the wisdom of Act 67. <clears throat> I know it's the law and, and, and that's the way that it's got to go, but this seems like what they've done is they've put the cart before the horse in this case, in that you're not able to, to really vet out what you think might be best for your community versus sets of standards that you don't even know exactly how you can apply to these sorts of things or even what the downstream effect is to me it seems a lot more like this is gonna this certainly favors a larger business because they're gonna have they're gonna have the resources to be able to put into these evidentiary studies and things like that versus what your individuals are so even if the individuals could get together to, to make a counterpoint to this then you're up to evidence versus evidence and then what does that do well, if, if you have, I mean, if there is evidence supporting either an approval or a denial, then, you know, you all have to make the decision. But you, right. you have to, uh, so. But then who decides, you know, which, which one outweighs the other one? So if you have well, evidence the, that shows yeah. one way and shows the other way, well, what's the, what's the as truth? Long as, there's a, as long as there's evidence to support the decision, then the decision should be, and the, Plan Commission and the Council. Well, that's the other thing I want to mention. So, we, with our CUPs, it's a Plan Commission recommendation to the Council, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Which I think is another challenge in this context, because the hearing and all the testimony is presented here at the Plan Commission, and then you have to make a, an evidence-based recommendation, and then it goes up to Council. Yeah. They haven't heard any of the testimony, and they have to make the final decision. And, in in my opinion. It, when you're making legislation like adopting an ordinance, it makes sense to have, say, a committee or a commission do the work and make a recommendation and then have the council make a final policy decision. But when you're doing quasi-judicial decision-making, to me, having two separate bodies making, you know, the decision, one holding the hearing and making a recommendation, and then the other making a decision, not having heard the evidence and so on, I think it doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. personally. Um, so, but it is, to your, I mean, to your example, if there's evidence that supports both an approval and a denial, then either decision should survive a, a, a review by a court, anyway. As to the underlying wisdom and the philosophical thinking behind Act 67, 
I mean, this actually gets to some very interesting uh, differences of an opinion if, from a political and philosophical standpoint about yeah. uh, how government should work. Um, and there are those who, who um, distrust, uh, you know, giving authority to people like you to make individualized determinations that aren't based on cl clear standards. They, they want a different kind of process. They're in control of the legislature these days. Well, and the other thing we, we've heard is we go to seminars and there's a possibility that at some point this could be reversed. And if it does, yeah. and we, you know, we've gone through and done the work, then what do we do? Do we keep our new ordinances or do we re go back to what we had or if it's somewhere in between there? Well, I so, mean, do, can yeah. you put in enough flexibility so this thing will serve us whether Act 67 is in place or not? Well, I, I think the answer is if you adapted your ordinance to comply with Act 67 and then the law changed to, to, to be like it was before Act 67, you could still operate lawfully under your new ordinance, which is Act 67 compliant. But you would then have the opportunity to kind of gradually build in more discretionary type latitude and flexibility back into your code, uh, and you could do that. Um, is there a way to draft a code that is both compliant with Act 67 and, you know, operates under the old rules? Not really. Um, and again, we, we haven't seen any actual cases yet come down giving us guidance on exactly how the court is going to interpret what's a reasonable standard. So, you know, yeah, we don't want to be the first, right? Well, we wouldn't want to be, this is the, one of the conundrums, right? Do you want to be the first to invest in redoing your zoning code when you're doing the best you can, but you still don't have an absolute clarity as to what, how the courts are going to view this? You don't want to be the first to be in, in litigation and, um, and end up making that law. So, yeah. Could that conditional use then, could that be challenged by, I mean, if, if it were to be approved because it was it, it applied to the standard or it met the standard, but what if uh, what if you have your group of neighbors that decide well they're going to band together and have a class action lawsuit on it? Is that a possibility? Uh, yeah, it is a possibility that they that a, uh, a, a landowner neighboring property owners who are affected could choose to challenge the decision and say you shouldn't have approved this because there wasn't substantial evidence to support. The decision, for example, so then Un do they unlikely. The however, city or do they challenge the applicant? They would be challenging the city's decision. But where hands are tied. Well, you you would you would be if the if the approval if the decision of the city is we feel that we need to approve this because there isn't you know the the evidence demonstrates they meet the standards and there is not any you know there isn't there's a lack of evidence showing that they don't. So we're going to approve it. If that's your position, you could say your hands are tied in a sense by the law. And Seems like this sets up a catch-22. That's the point. The whole point is to say you're not allowed to just do what you want. You have to follow the law. Hmm. Any other questions or comments or, I mean, <laughs> one more. sure. So if, if they bring forth what their evidence to approve this permit for, and if, if there was contrary evidence that said, okay, you know, if we say it's going to do this, they say, no, that's not really going to do that. So what if one of those, what if that comes true? Can there be any litigation after that? If, like, a, I told you so, litigation after that. You mean what if uh, they present evidence saying we will meet this standard, we will not belch nasty smoke out the smokestack? Sure. And then it turns out they do belch nasty smoke out the smokestack. Well, <clears throat> if there was litigation at that point, it it wouldn't be. It, you they'd have the zoning in place, they'd have the CUP in place. If we have other standards that they're in violation of, air pollution standards, they could be pursued on that basis. There could also be a nuisance case. Sure. Yeah. Just say the hard part to that is they're already established and running, so it's going to happen, and then it's going to take years in order to get it to stop. 
true. That's the part that I don't care for. Yeah. Well, and, and then we have this, we have this other interesting language in this ordinance that allows you to treat something as a limited conditional use, where you say that, you know, you're going to approve it, but only for a limited time, for example. And you can make that determination under this ordinance. It says, because of the following, here, so it says, because of the following, the particular specialized nature, well, I don't know, what does that mean, I don't know, the particular location within a district. So you might say, because of this particular location, we can only approve you for a limited time. Well, I mean, there may be a situation where the facts suggest that because of this location, we can only approve you for a limited time, and that makes sense. But, um, yeah. My major concern in it is if, if you get stuck into something and you've got to wait years for courts to decide what that sort of thing is, you know, if you have something that's uh, going to be environmentally threatening, and even though it might meet the standards of a significantly handicapped EPA recently. Well, and that's why we're here tonight to say, if you see that you've got a conditional use in your zoning code that worries you, let's get it out before it's too late. Mm -hmm. I think in some of them, they need to have like much, much more cogent definitions about certain things. Because some, some of the things, you know, I wonder about with, with the fracking sand, did, did they identify fracking sand specifically within their ordinance, or was that like, you know, like mining? mining? In the all energy case, I think it was non-metallic mining probably or something like that. Well, who, I'm not who sure. Who knew that fracking sand at that point, who knew it was going to be a commodity? at that stage. I mean, I know it, yeah. it has been for a while, but who knew it would be a highly profitable commodity at the moment. So yeah. it seems like we're, we're setting up different series of standards that we don't necessarily know even exist or that are available at the time. So you can't anticipate what the demand of things are going to be if you don't know what, the, what they're going to be before the demand is there, the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, we're here to say, I don't want you to be in a position where you are sitting there saying, you mean my hands are tied? I have to either vote in favor of this or know that if I vote against it, we're probably, we're going to get sued and we're probably going to lose. Right. I'd like to avoid that by cleaning up the ordinance before that happens. Or, or not. And then wait so and see what happens. What are we looking for tonight? Are we looking for some direction to do some additional work? Or are we looking for, you know, some sort of a recommendation on what, what's in the packet? Or what do you guys think the next steps might be? We, we are not certainly seeking any particular uh, action on this item tonight. Um, it was a presentation, but we also are trying to gauge the interest of the plan commission on how involved we want to uh, undertake this this effort. Um, for example, we've we've put in in the packet a table of um, maybe low hanging fruit, <laughs> um, and there might be others, but we're just trying to characterize, uh, you know, maybe a, an approach to try to remove some as conditional uses and make them permitted in districts. And if the commission was generally supportive of that, we'd prepare you know, a draft amendment to particular districts for your consideration. Um, I think initially we'd bring it here even before a public hearing so that we're gauging um, the level of support and direction on, on what we might see as appropriate amendments to the code. Um, you know, the, that's, that's a, the part that I see as the easier part. The, the more challenging part is trying to identify if there's standards that we should be creating that we don't have on the books now and or outlining additional processes um, outside of the conditional use process that really are not defensible. I think, I think it actually might be easier just to look at the which ones we actually want to have as conditional uses. It might be easier to look at it that way than go through and, and pluck them out. 
would it be something then that we could, uh, so if we have something that isn't quite addressed within our ordinance and somebody wants a conditional use permit, then would we have to go back in and relook at the ordinance and modify that before we could issue a conditional use then? Well, one thing you have to remember, once someone submits an application, you have to evaluate that based on whatever the ordinance is at the time that's submitted. You can't say, well, wait a minute, we're going to go fix our ordinance and then we'll talk to you later. Go ahead, uh, Tom. Um, this may not be a popular view, but I don't think we ought to be addressing this at all. I, I really think, for, in fact, from the complexity of what Matt's describing to us and who, who has a conditional use and who doesn't and all these things, we're here now. It's a fairly nice little city. Um, I, I really don't see how jumping ahead and trying to solve some problems that could come up in the future, probably in every little small or middle-sized city in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of legal work involved in the, in the views that have come up. We don't, we don't need to be the lead character in a, um, you know, some kind of duel. I, I think I think we're doing fine and we have a, a very nice city, very nice citizens and they all listen to reason. I think we ought to leave this alone. Are we compliant with Act 67 currently? Uh, I question some of the standards in your ordinance. I think there's some here that would clearly not be. Well, I, I just know that from past experience and looking like at the downtown overlay ordinance, um, I think a lot of this relates to just not being careful with verbiage and wording. I think there's a lot of of overwordiness to the to the codes. I think in a lot of cases it makes our job harder because of the way things are worded and and all the extra verbiage that's in there. And I think in a lot of ways we could simplify our role and simplify our job um, by cleaning the code up in a lot of ways. I think there's a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be in there. Um, now, the one thing I think this does impact, though, to some extent, doesn't it, is fees collected by the city. Aren't, don't we currently collect different fees for conditional use approval because? Sure. And so there's the potential, if you remove all conditional use permits, that, that the city actually mm -hmm. then will collect less through the permit process. We certainly don't use it as a revenue generator. Sure. I mean, obviously, we have publication and, and administration related to the, the conditional use hearing process. I, I think we had less than 20 CUPs last year. Okay. Um, so I, I think it might have even been closer to a dozen, but yeah. not, nonetheless, uh, there is, you're, you're right, there's a fee associated with it. Um, 400 bucks, 300 bucks. 440, something, something like so that. There is, right. So it's not nothing. Um, but we don't look at it as... It's not why we created them. It's not why it's been created that way, correct. Um, but yeah, I, my opinion is, I think a lot of this is just going through and making things clearer. Um, and in a lot of cases, I think it's easier for us to have more defined standards or remove uses or not remove uses based on a, an actual discussion of it versus then being surprised by it later and not have any appropriate criteria or standards because there's a lot of the, the way it's worded that we can't, even as commissioners, make decisions based on, I mean, decisions that I think are justifiable or not. It ends up being just our opinion or, or subjective. Yeah. And, and that, I think, puts a lot of pressure on us as commissioners versus, um, I, I have found that even though it was a lot of work, but I think the process for evaluating work within the downtown has actually become a little bit clearer to evaluate and, and a smoother process, not only for people making the investment, but for us as commissioners evaluating it. And I think there's opportunities to do that in other places. Now, I mean, it, it maybe doesn't have to be everything, um, but there's certainly, I think, places that can be cleaned up. So what would the process look like? Would you? continue to go after the low-hanging fruit and then or 
establish some criteria and then implement it all at once, or would you do it in phases? I mean, I, I think you'd have to do it in chunks. <laughs> I, we can't. I don't think we'd do a unilateral rewrite of the entire code, um, but I do think that there might be an opportunity for us to highlight sections, whether it's group development or uh, select permitted or select conditional uses within certain districts that may or may not be appropriate, um, and bring back a menu of suggestions to have that dialogue with the commission and talk through those and see if they have legs. If, if so, we'd move those aspects on to public hearing and consideration. If not, um, we'll reevaluate and see if there's a different standards route we should take. Does that seem acceptable? Yeah, I agree. Clean it up and at least bring it to, to minimum mm -hmm. compliance for, for them. A point to note would be that, uh, you know, over the years, I, I think we've only put conditions on maybe one or two conditional uses which kind of tells you something mm -hmm. we just don't don't even put conditions on most of them so then this would be back on a future meeting and then we can see how in-depth it's going to get and if it looks like it's going to get us too deep then we can retreat or we can continue to move forward yep does that sound reasonable do you have stuff to say, Phil, after I kept ste nope. stepping in front of you? <laughs> Just one, one last thought. Um, it seems to me like there's a strong connection between the debates that we'll probably have about some of these uses <coughs> and the debates that went on as part of the comprehensive planning process. And, and I don't know if there's any insight that, that that can come out of that. I mean, because a lot of these conversations were had as the community evaluated use as relates to the broader land use discussions. Um, and, and I know the comp plan went so far, they didn't rewrite all our ordinances, but it right. would seem like there might be some information there that would at least help inform some of these d discussions about uses and, I mean, I don't, you guys have run into thoughts on that. Well, uh, uh, certainly there was a time when we were talking large retail ordinance stuff and we were dealing with a comprehensive plan amendment and um, I, I think some of those nuances don't fit well within the code structure right now. Not that you're not trying to manage and regulate them, but um, how that is handled is clumsy within the code, whether it's group development standards or um, CUP standards, so I think there might be an opportunity to still accomplish what the intent was, uh, but not make it so clumsy. <laughs> so we'll look at some of those. Good. Okay. Anything else? Otherwise, uh, any future agenda items? Well, we'll have the re reopening the public hearing for the quick trip okay. site okay. at the next meeting. We may have zinc if they're ready for their site plan. I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, to adjourn. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. We're adjourned. Thank you.